but eventually we're going to shift into a native design. That is, we start to imagine the possibilities that are uniquely enabled by these 10X increases in capability by GPT-4. And this is going to create brand new product categories. Hey there, this is Travis Kassab. I'm a former UX researcher and now I help product designers get their ideal careers. And I've been thinking a lot about what I wish I had known in my career. And one of them was I wish I had considered more the design space of the product that I was working on. I wish that I had known how explored the design space was, meaning how many products had already been built within the category or had specifically been built using a technology. See, technologies create new design spaces. They create new worlds because a new technology is like 10x or 100x better than what came before it and this makes new things possible new products are possible in these new paradigms there are three different levels of maturity for a technology there are novel technologies these are the most new then there are growth technologies which is somewhere in between and then you have legacy technologies these are the oldest they've been around for the longest we know what to expect from these technologies and the analogy i'm using throughout this video is that technologies are like worlds because many things can be built on technologies. These are products, just like how many cities can be built on worlds. And also technologies have an ecosystem around them of talent or developer tooling that enable things to be built with the technology. This is kind of like worlds where you have roads and bridges that help you get around the world. So each have their own infrastructures. And so as a technology or world becomes more mature, so does the infrastructure of that technology, which means that it becomes easier to build on the technology or world. So novel technologies are the latest and greatest, but they have the least amount of adoption because they are so new. And they're usually orders of magnitude better than what came before them. So think like 10X or 100X better, faster, cheaper. And this is usually a result of a scientific discovery or engineering breakthrough. So GPT-4 is a good example of a novel technology. It's 10x better at least than the conversational intelligence that have come before it. And this is what's led to the surge in interest in AI over the past year. Novel technologies make brand new things possible. And this is why you're resetting the design space when you have a novel technology. If something really is an order of magnitude better than what came before it, then entirely new things are possible. So of course, GPT GPT-4 is giving us better chatbots and ChatGPT took the world by storm and many startups are building conversational assistance on top of it, but specific for specific domains like law and finance and medical. But we're not just going to get better chatbots from this increase in conversational intelligence. This is what Chris Dixon calls skeuomorphic design, where the reason we think about better chatbots is because it's what we're most familiar with when it comes to AI. This is skeuomorphic design, but eventually we're going to shift into a native design. That is, we start to imagine the possibilities that are uniquely enabled by these 10X increases in capability by GPT-4. And this is going to create brand new product categories. So a couple examples would be uh, the LLMOS that uh, one of the uh, leading voices in AI is talking about how operating systems are going to be centered around this conversational intelligence. We have Humane's AI pin, which is going to disrupt the smartphone. And instead of using mostly graphical user interfaces for interacting with our devices, we're going to move to a voice first paradigm with AI pins. And then also you have chat GPT browse, which is reimagining internet search. So it's, it's disrupting Google, who really hasn't seen much competition for the past 20 years. And now an AI goes out, looks through the information for you and returns the relevant information in whatever format you choose. And so my point with all this is that the AI design space is still mostly unexplored. We've had 10x capability improvements, but we really haven't started to think more natively on how to use these improvements in the new AI. And this is true for all novel technologies. All novel technologies have mostly unexplored design spaces because they're so new and because so few people know about them or know how to use them. So if AI isn't your thing, but unexplored design spaces are, then there are many other novel technologies that you can choose from. So one example is CRISPR-Cas9. This is a gene editing technology and it's 10x faster, cheaper, better, uh, more accurate than the previous gene editing technologies, which is enabling 
personalized medicine startups to build on top of this new novel technology. And another example is metal 3D printing, which is making it 10x faster for engineers to go from a digital design to a physical part. And this is being used to 3D print reusable rockets by Relativity Space. So I think you're starting to see how novel technologies change the paradigm of things. And what this means is that the old paradigm and the mental models and design patterns within it are no longer relevant. So product designers working with novel technologies get the opportunity to build new mental models and design patterns from scratch. This means that it's going to take more design thinking and it's going to be more time consuming for you to design, but you'll also have the chance to influence how products are designed within your category for years, maybe even decades to come. Also, novel technologies have the least mature infrastructure. So there are many infrastructure gaps that are going to inconvenience you. And AI's infrastructure gap right now is the GPU shortage. There's more demand for GPUs, which run the AI models, than there is supply of them. Them. And so this is making compute costs increase and it's making it prohibitively expensive for some use cases, at least for right now. Finally, there's the least amount of talent in novel technologies. This means the least amount of designers and developers and entrepreneurs have gone into novel technologies because they're still kind of unproven and people are hesitant about spending the time and energy to develop an expertise in them. But my personal opinion is that this is a great way to differentiate yourself as a product designer because there are so few other designers in the field compared to growth and legacy technologies that this is your way to differentiate yourself. It's going to make it easier for you in job interviews, especially if you're highly aligned with the company that you're applying for. You might be able to have an above average pay relative to your experience level when you go into novel technologies because there is this scarcity. And I think even if the technology, since it is unproven, eventually fizzles out, I think hiring managers will still be impressed that you took the risk to do this and they'll rightly sense that you can see further into the future in the domain that you are working in. Now we'll talk about growth technologies and the example we'll use here is Bitcoin, which in my opinion, it's a great example. It actually just went from its novelty stage where only early adopters were buying it to now it's in this growth stage where there's institutional demand. Large financial institutions now want to purchase Bitcoin and you may have heard some of this on the news with Bitcoin ETF and this is gonna give the institutional investors access to Bitcoin. So around 100 million people own Bitcoin right now and soon many more will. And so Bitcoin is at this tipping point in adoption and it's a good opportunity for product designers to start getting involved, to start to learn a little bit about cryptocurrencies and digital collectibles and to start to add these things to your portfolio because I still think that you can differentiate yourself with an understanding in Bitcoin product design. So what changed for Bitcoin that led to this institution institutional adoption because this was something that these institutions had been fearing and publicly avoiding for quite a while. And I think you can't discount the sheer amount of time that it's been in existence. It was launched, I think, in 2009, but for sure it's the longest standing cryptocurrency ever. Many cryptocurrencies have gone, come and gone since then, but Bitcoin has been around the longest. And I think that as more time passes, people become more and more comfortable with it and believe that it's going to stay around and it's not just going to disappear. Also, Bitcoin now has clarity in the United States, regulatory clarity. So what I mean is the US government considers Bitcoin a digital commodity and this clarity without going into the details it just makes it less risky for institutions to own Bitcoin and for businesses to build products on Bitcoin. So let's talk about more products integrating Bitcoin. We have payment apps like PayPal and Robinhood, Cash App, they allow people to access and trade Bitcoin. Then you have some online retailers like Microsoft and Overstock that are accepting Bitcoin as payments. You have countries who now have accepted Bitcoin as legal tender within their borders. They've accepted Bitcoin as a currency. And also you have apps that recently just added Bitcoin tipping to their application. So this all indicates that the ecosystem around Bitcoin, like the developer tooling, has become 
mature enough to make these integrations possible in the first place. So long story short, institutions are now willing to buy Bitcoin because it's a more proven technology. And adoption of Bitcoin is just gonna keep increasing from here. As more people hear that more people are buying it, then this is gonna to lead to a positive feedback loop. And then also as the ecosystem matures, more developers will be able to more easily integrate Bitcoin into their apps. So this positive feedback loop is true of all growth technologies. As the ecosystem matures, matures and becomes more accessible to people, then more people come in and build products. And with more people building products, the ecosystem is forced to mature even more, which leads to more adoption. Bitcoin's design space is much more explored than it was 10 years ago. So as a novel technology, Bitcoin birthed entirely new product categories like crypto exchanges, wallets, node services, block explorers. And now as a growth technology, Bitcoin is going to be adapted to new users and new use cases. So so for example, crypto exchanges, which once only needed to appeal to retail early adopters, are now building separate institutional crypto exchange products, and Coinbase Custody is an example of this. So the designers working here are going to be able to reuse a lot of the mental models and design patterns that came before, but still a significant amount of UX is going to meet, need to be rethought for these institutional users like how to make transferring Bitcoin safer if it's a very large amount, like hundreds of millions of dollars. And who has the authority? How do you manage the authority of people who can transfer Bitcoin? But even though more people know what Bitcoin is and what it can be used for, I still think that the design space hasn't been fully explored. And I think it actually could change quite a bit from here since it's still in its earliest stages as a growth technology. Right now, entrepreneurs are building Bitcoin into decentralized finance. There are micropayment rewards words apps that people are experimenting with, and then even artwork is being built on Bitcoin with Bitcoin ordinals. And finally, we come to legacy technologies, which are the most mature and the most things have been built on top of it. And a good example of a legacy technology is the smartphone. I'm clustering smartphone together. I know it's composed of many different technologies, but if we think about it as a technological platform, many products have been built on the smartphone. Don't let the fact that Apple releases a new iPhone every year fool you. There are no 10x improvements year over year. And so this is why I say that the smartphone paradigm and design space is set in stone. Everyone knows what it means to unlock your phone, to silence notifications, to download the app. So the mental models and design patterns within this paradigm is relatively set in stone and it would actually hurt UX to change and experiment with these things because users have become so accustomed to them over the years. The design space has been pretty damn explored. I don't really expect many new mobile apps to surprise me in their capabilities. Apple has done a lot with their native apps and thousands of third-party developers over the past decade have launched many new apps onto the App Store. This isn't to say that no new products can be built on legacy technologies like the smartphone. I don't think that at all. I think that products or apps probably launch every single day and some of them might generate a lot of revenue for the company. But my point is that the mobile apps that do launch really won't surprise us in what they can do. We've probably seen it before. Now, legacy technologies eventually get phased out by new technologies that change the paradigm. So something that we're looking at in smartphones is the AI pin, which changes it from a graphics first paradigm into a voice first paradigm. And then also we have spatial devices like Apple Vision, which kind of changed the interaction as well. It can detect eye movement and subtle hand gestures. So these are some paradigm shifts that I expect to be coming in the future that will disrupt the smartphone. And the point here is that designers working on these next gen devices will be able to build mental models and design patterns from scratch to fit these new paradigms. Okay, so to summarize all of this, we've been talking about the different design spaces and how explored they are. And this is determined by the maturity of the technology that your product is built on. So as you move to the left in a technological maturity, there is less talent present. There are fewer designers, fewer entrepreneurs, and fewer developers who have decided to spend the time to build an expertise in this because it's still unproven. The design space is more unexplored. There are more new possibilities that we probably haven't even discovered yet. Also, as you move further to the left, there's less infrastructure. There are less tools or there are 
infrastructure gaps for building products with the technology. And so there are fewer products that have been built because of these infrastructure gaps or just because the technology is so new. And then finally, there are fewer mental models and design patterns. At least there are fewer established ones because there are almost no products on there. And so fewer designers have come before you and it will be more your job as a designer to build the mental models and design patterns to fit this new paradigm. However, when we move further to the left, there's more talent. It's more crowded with inhabitants. It's easier to build with because the infrastructure is there. There are few infrastructure gaps. Um, and so more products are going to have been built on this technology. The mental models and design patterns are stable and you're not gonna have much wiggle room here as a designer. You're gonna have to reuse a lot of things because users have already become accustomed to these design patterns and mental models. And so changing them would actually hurt the UX. And also the design space is more saturated. We have a good idea of what to expect from the technology and the low hanging fruit for entrepreneurship has already been picked. It's going to be more difficult because it's more crowded and more competitive. These are the three different types of technology. You have novel growth and legacy technology. And I don't think we should put the cart before the horse. You shouldn't pick your job solely based on the technology that the product is built on. But I do think that being more deliberate in your choice, that adding this as a criteria to what product and what job you work in would be helpful for your fulfillment as a product designer. Thanks so much.